Shalom Chavring, I'm Stephen Ben Danun with Danun Institute of Biblical uh, Research. And Shabbat Shalom to you here in Israel from the Mount of Olives overlooking the old city and behind me. Today I want to share with you guys a rather interesting uh, scripture found in 2 Kings, uh, I believe that's the 21st uh, chap 22nd chapter that is. In the 22nd chapter we find that Josiah uh, who had became a king at eight years old, he was a godly young man, especially when he, in eight, 18 years later, when he commissioned uh, the, the high priest at that time, uh, who was, um, I actually got some of the scriptures here, I wanted to share with you on that, but let me just, uh, Hilkiah was the high priest. And when King Josiah was 26 years old, he had commissioned the high priest to take the money that was in the treasury of the temple and give it unto the workmen, give it to the carpenters to help restore damaged areas that had been damaged. Well, in the process of doing this, they ran across one of the Torah scrolls, one of the laws of Moses that was there. They came and read that before the king, and when they did, the king realized that Israel, the, the, the house of Judah, was living in sin at that time. Let me share with you a little bit about what it actually says here. If we go to the, um, um, oh, about midway in the ninth verse says, Thy servants have poured out the money that was found in the house and delivered it into the hand of the workmen that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan, the scribe, told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, and Hikam the son of Shaphan, and Achbor the son of Micah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Asiah the king's servant, saying, Go you inquire of the Lord for me and for the people, for all Judah concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened to the words of this book, to do according unto all which is written concerning us. So Hilkiah the priest, and Achim, and Achor, and Shaphan, and Asiah went unto Huldah, the prophetess, the wife of Shulam, the son of Tikva, the son of Haras, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke with her. And she said to them, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, tell you the man that sent you unto me. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king Judah hath read, because they have forsaken me and have offered unto other gods, that they may provoke me. All the works of their hands before my wrath shall be kindled against this place, and it shall not be quenched. But unto thee, king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus uh, excuse me, thus shall you say to him, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard, because thy heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself before the Lord when thou heardest what I spoke against this place and against this inhabitants thereof, that they should become an astonishment and a curse, and hast rent thy clothes and wept before me. I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will gather thee to thy fathers. Thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace. Neither shall thine eyes see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. And they brought back word unto the king. This part here I wanted to share with you because it's just an astonishment. It's astonishing because a king of Israel actually recognized that Israel was not keeping the very word of God that they were supposed to be keeping. Notice also how that when the book is read and Hulda, which is a woman prophetess, the high priest goes to her along with the scribe, the king needing to have word back again, and Hulda was a woman prophetess and prophesied in Israel concerning the things that would come upon Israel, concerning the king and the kindness that God would show unto him. You know, I find it very interesting. If you think back during the times of Yeshua when he was here, Yeshua actually was very staunch 
in supporting women at that time. In fact, it was women that brought the, the message of his resurrection into his apostles. And when the apostles didn't believe him because it was a woman's testimony, he abraded them for their unbelief. So many times we get the scriptures mixed up when we look at the writings of, of Paul. And that's, that's a shame to the Christian community because, well, I should say more of a lack of knowledge and understanding because a lot has been hidden from the Christian people of what Paul really wrote. They didn't want to translate it the correct way because well, there's people in churches that want to keep power and authority over you. But when Paul said that the man is the head of the woman and Christ is the head of the man, the word there in English, we think of the word head as authority. In the Greek language, it's actually source. Just like, in other words, when God taken, he created Adam. He was the source. And we know the Bible says that nothing was created or exists, that Jesus didn't make himself. Everything was made for him and by him. So therefore, it was him that created Adam. He's the one that formed him in the Garden of Eden. And from Adam... Eve was taken and formed as well. Now the scripture where Paul speaks comes more into light. And that's really not what we're focusing on at this particular point here, but I'm focused more on the issue of what Josiah saw and what God had commanded Josiah to do. Josiah was there to see that Israel had not kept God's commandments. Another fascinating th fact that we might look at when we look at Huldah as being the prophetess of God that actually prophesies the king of what would take place in his lifetime and what God would do to Israel as well is that she's also a type of the believer of today, the believer in Yeshua, because as a woman she represents the true believer, the bride of Christ in this case here. And oddly enough, the gospel will come back to the Jews and it will come back as a believer in the hour that we're living in. The two witnesses themselves, we know for a fact that they believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. There's no doubt about that. It's clear, especially when we see written in the Word of God, that on the Mount Transfiguration stood with Yeshua, Moses and Elijah, Moshe Eliyahu which are representation of the two witnesses that will come in this day. And if they believed him then, they will certainly believe him now. So they come as a type of the bride of Christ to bring the gospel message of what will happen to Israel from a prophetic standpoint. I'd like to share with you a little bit further, though, if we go into chapter 23 into 2 Kings, and it says here, And the king sent and gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. <clears throat> and he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. <clears throat> And the king stood on a platform and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to confirm the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people stood to the covenant. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and the priest of the second order and the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord the vessels that were made for Baal and for Asherah and for all the host of heaven, and burned, <clears throat> burned them without, uh, excuse me, burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron, and carried the ashes of them into Bethel. And he put down the idolatrous priest whom the kings of Judah had ordained to offer in the high places in the cities of Judah, in the places round about Jerusalem. Them also that offered unto Baal, to the sun, and to the moon, and to the constellations, to all the host of heaven, and brought out Asherah from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem, and the brook of Kidron, and burned it at the brook of Kidron, and stamped it into small powder, and cast powder thereof upon the graves and the common people of the common people. And he broke down the houses of the Sodomites that were in the house of the Lord, where the women wove coverings for, the, uh, for Asherah, 
and he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and, def and defiled the high place. Excuse me, and defiled the high places where the priests had made offerings from Geba to Beersheba. Beersheba. And he broke down the high places of the gates that were at the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were of the man's left hand. And he entered the gate of the city. Nevertheless, the priest of the high places came not up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they did eat unleavened bread among their brethren. And he defiled Topheth, which is the valley of the son of Hinnon, that no man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Molech. Now, we could go on and on and on and read about what Josiah did. And his, the things that Josiah did are the most honorable things that any king could ever do for Israel. Any minister of the gospel could do for his people is to bring his people to the true word of God. To make a dedication in your heart to serve God with all of your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. When I think about it, God brought Israel back here as a nation. Now, there's some that may argue that. If you, if you go back to um, uh, Rehoboam, who was the king of Israel, and we look at the things that happened with Rehoboam, Rehoboam seemingly uh, was rebelling against the advice of the elders of Israel when uh, he was the king of Judah, when he uh, should speak more kindly unto the house of Israel. To the northern tribes there but he actually says he of course he's this uh, one of the sons of Solomon he says no I'll be more harsh takes the advice of the younger people now that does seem to be very awkward but we read in the Bible though that God actually anointed him to say these things because God was going to carry out his word where he said the two the nation would be divided we'd have the house of Judah and the house of Israel and of course the scripture was fulfilled it didn't happen necessarily the way we would think it would when we first look at it by the outward appearance, but it's the way God intended. And so when Israel became a nation in 1948, there's many that argue, well, it was the Rothschilds, it was the Vatican that was involved, it was the Vatican trying to bring certain Jews here in order to gain a stronghold and to overcome uh, the Arabic presence that was here. But it was God fulfilling his word. God is able to still put in the hearts of whoever he wants, whether they're good or bad, to fulfill his will. And that's exactly what he did here in Israel. 1967 gave us a good idea that God was actually with his people. For he fought for Israel in the Six-Day War, like he did in times past. Like he did with Joshua. Like he did with the different kings of Israel, David, and overcame the enemy and drove out six nations when they were outnumbered a hundred to one. And yet with all of the evidence that God has shown that he is with his people, why hasn't the kings of Israel done more to put an end to the things that are happening all about us? We think about it with Josiah. The Bible says that he tore down the altars from within the temple, around the temple as well. And throughout all of Judea, Judah, the land of Israel. It's sad to say, though, that since the deliverance of Israel and the creation of the state of Israel, God did not do this according to some goodness that the Jewish people have done, but yet rather even according to the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 36 where God says to Israel, I do not do this for you, I do this for my name's sake. I will gather you from all the countries in which I have scattered you and I will bring you back to your place. And I do this, O Israel, not because of you, but because for my name's sake I will gather you from all the places whether I've scattered you to and I will bring you back. And then we think about that Prime Minister Netanyahu was actually anointed to be a king over Israel. He's ran two terms here. But unfortunately, in behind me, as you can see, all the high places, all the temples into Baal, all the temples into the sun god and the moon god, the Catholic churches, the, the Arabic mosques, they're everywhere in this land polluting the very land that God said should be a land of holiness. I guess it'll take God himself to come 
and to wipe out these things because no king of Israel seems to have the ability to do so. In fact, more so, our prime minister is acting like King Saul, not obeying the word of God, not like his forefather David, nor like Josiah or Asa. Some of the, and Hezekiah, the great kings of Israel that actually would tear down the high places and, and remove the groves and things that were not of God. When will this change? When will, will there come a reckoning in this day and removal of these things? It'll be, it will begin when God sends the two witnesses to Israel. Then and only then will we begin to see a change take place, begin to see a change take place when the power of Almighty God is on the land of Israel once again. Let me just close in saying this to my beloved friends around the world, our Christian friends that are everywhere that believe that Yeshua is Messiah. Can I not encourage you as well? Any, anything in your heart that is not purely for the Lord, tear it down. If there's any altars to Baal, any, any altars to the sun god, the moon god, or anything that is not of God, take it out of your heart and repent. Do like Josiah, repent before the Lord that you may be found worthy in that day to be with our fathers. Maybe not so much in burial, but maybe in a resurrection, maybe in a rapture where you can go and be with our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who stood for the word of God relentlessly let's be found with them let's be found in a way that is pleasing unto God because certainly the hour we live in here the things that are happening in this land here it's because there are no kings here that are willing to make that stand you know the Bible says in the latter days Israel will seek their king David their king well It'll take the Messiah to come, to change. And I can guarantee you one thing, there will be no Dome of the Rock left when he comes. There will be no Vatican Church in the background. There will be no Catholic Church on this land whatsoever when he comes. Anything that exalts itself above God will not be here. And you will not see the voices of women being silenced either. You will see as it was in the days of Hulda, the prophetess, the women were given a right to prophesy and speak as well as it was in the days of Yeshua when he was here. And, and the women came and ran to the apostles and told them that he had risen. You'll see a much different way when he comes. Not the way that we intended to be, but the way God intended it to be. Shabbat Shalom. God bless you. I trust today will be a blessing for you. Do remember us as well in your prayers. And as the Lord lays on your heart to support this ministry, we desperately need you. Without you, the work that we do in Israel is not possible. Bringing the messages that God lays on my heart to deliver to you. And my wife soon will be active again in the ministry. She has so much to share, so much that she can share with you guys that I know would be a blessing to you as well. So pray for us, and we thank you for being a part and to support this ministry. God bless you. I'm Stephen Bendenoon with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. Shalom.